Let's talk about hypergraphs. Wolfram Physics reimagines the universe as a graph of nodes and edges, or to get a little bit more technical, as a hypergraph of hypernodes and hyperedges. And just for our listeners who've not seen my previous videos, in graphs each edge involves two nodes, and in hypergraphs each hyperedge can involve any number of hypernodes, so that's it's just an extension of graphs. So why do you think that the hypergraph is such a promising model for the underlying nature of reality? That's a really interesting question. Okay, so I think it ultimately has to do with... Okay, let, let me make... A, to answer that, let me make an analogy to another discrete approach to doing quantum gravity, which is causal set theory, CST. So in causal set theory, the idea is, you know, it's the sort of... The nice thing about CST is that it's kind of conceptually the minimal discrete model for space-time that you could think of, right? So Penrose taught us that everything you really care about to do with space-time you can encode in its causal structure, or you can encode in what you might call the topology of its time-like curves. That basically, yeah. space-time is some big collection of events. For every pair of events, that pair of events is either space-like separated, light-like separated, or time-like separated. And that gives us a causal structure. And that causal structure is invariant under conformal transformations, those conformal transformations encompassing both boosts in reference frames from special relativity, but also changes in gravitational frames from general relativity. So Penrose taught us really that, that if you know the causal structure of space-time, if you know this partial order that tells you which events are causally related and which events are not causally related, then you kind of know almost everything there is to know about the space-time, right? You, you, in fact, nine-tenths of the metric tensor is determined by the causality. Yeah. The remaining one-tenth is determined by the volume. And so CST, which is a set of ideas that really goes back to Raphael Sorkin, had this idea that, okay, well, therefore, we can imagine just discretizing space-time by considering it to be a countable collection of events and then causal relationships between them, discrete causal relationships between them, which you can represent using a graph. You could represent that yeah. as just a directed acyclic graph called a Hassa diagram for that space-time. And then, you know, the, then the idea is that the structure of the graph gives you the causality, and then the number of nodes inside a region and the number of vertices inside a region gives you some discrete analog of volume. So immediately yeah. you've got some discrete version of relativity, and then you can yeah. start building off that. So this is a, this is a good idea, right? So a CST yes. is, a, is, a, is a good idea and, and, a, and an interesting one and one that's worth pursuing. But, you know, the kind of the thing that limited CST was the fact that they didn't really have a promising dynamics, right? They, 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 everything that they were doing was really kinematical. They, they kind of said, well, let's, let's start with a continuous space time. Let's construct a causal set that approximates it. And let's see what we can reconstruct about the space time from that causal set. That's a perfectly interesting yeah. and reasonable thing to do. And it's a good first step towards developing a discrete theory of quantum gravity. But of course, it's just kinematic, right? Yeah. What you want is some kind of procedure for actually building that graph, for building the causal structure that is your discrete approximation to the space-time. And causal set theory didn't, and to be honest, kind of still doesn't really have that. I mean, there are these, there are models of dynamics that have been proposed, things like classical sequential growth and quantum sequential growth, but they're really quite trivial and not very interesting. And the pathology that they suffer from is that they are dominated by very, very non-manifold-like causal graphs, right? Or non-manifold-like causal sets. In other words, the, 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 the dynamics that they defined had the property that the causal graphs you get out of them, almost all, almost all of them, in fact, you can prove that as a theorem, they, 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 you can prove that the non-manifold-like ones are so-called entropically dominant. So almost all of them have the property that they are very, very far away from being good approximations to continuous space-time, which is clearly bad as a, as a model yes. of quantum gravity goes, because, you know, yeah. say what you like about space-time, but it certainly, it does a very good job of looking continuous. So we want, yeah. we want our discrete model to be as close to a, a continuum approximation as possible. Yeah. Okay, so, so CST had this, had this problem that it didn't really have a good kind of growth dynamics. So one thing you might think to do would be to say, well, let's define some explicit algorithm that lets us build these causal graphs, that, that lets us build causal graphs, causal structures that are good approximations to space-time. Well, how might yeah. we do that? So one thing you could, okay, one thing that you want and the thing that CST really suffered from was the fact that the causal graphs you ended up having were highly non-local. That if you, if you try to take this, this graph approximation of your space-time and you try to slice across it to kind of reconstruct a, 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 a notion of space, yeah. that the, the notion of distance on that space was very, very far removed from the, the notion of distance, the so-called Riemannian distance that we're used to in relativity. Right. In, in, in particular, things that looked like they should be uh, very far apart ended up looking very close together and, 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 and vice versa. So yeah. it's not somehow the notion of distance, the notion of locality, all these things that you get out of these CST models from, from growth dynamics weren't very good. They, they were very far removed from the things we know to be, that we, we know to be accurate from relativity. 
and I should mention actually one one guy who is a, a sort of uh, predecessor of mine, so a, a spiritual predecessor of mine, Tommaso Bolognesi, who I think was really the first person to seriously suggest that it was worth investigating rewriting systems as a way of generating causal sets. So the idea there is you say, well, if I've got a if I've got a data structure, I don't know, say it's a string, right, a, a string of characters. I've got some, some basic data structure and I apply some rewriting rules to it. I can look at the causal structure of those rewrites, right? Because I can say for, for, for some rewrites, there will be, they will have the property that you couldn't have applied this rewrite unless this other rewrite had previously been applied. So for instance, yeah. maybe the first rewrite made use of some characters in the string that were only produced because, this, because the other rewrite had been applied first. So you can say in some meaningful sense that the, that, the se- that the second rewrite caused the first, that there's a causal link between the two. Yeah. So the idea is you can use some abstract rewriting system, and this is an idea that, that Stephen really kind of pioneered in NKS, these, this idea of causal graphs for rewriting systems. You can use an abstract rewriting system to build a causal structure. So, okay, this seems promising. This seems promising as a way to define a dynamics for building a, continu- uh, for building a discrete space-time. But what kind of data structure would you use, right? That's really the essence of your question. Well, strings are pretty bad, as are cellular automata and Turing machines and things, for various reasons. But, but one of the core ones is that they're far too rigid, right? If you think about a cellular automaton or a character string or a Turing machine, you have a rigid array of cells laid out yeah. in space. You have an a priori notion of space. First of all, that's pretty yes, bad from, from a relativity <laughs> yeah. point of view. It's, it's a very rigid structure. It's very hard to see how you could make something like a cellular automaton compatible with Lorentz invariance from special relativity, right? How you would make things like length contractions and yeah. so on work when you've got such a rigid kind of register. And it also, you know, it separates the notion of space from the notion of time. It separates the notion of space from the notion of states of cells. And, you know, we know that there are these deep principles of physics, like in particular, this principle of general covariance that basically says you can't do that, right? You can't yeah. neatly separate the notion of space from the notion of time. They're somehow, they, they, they have to be combined in some neat way. So those data structures that you might think of using clearly aren't going to work if we want a plausible model for physics. Yeah. So graphs and hypergraphs then just kind of drop out as the next most plausible, the, the, the next thing you might think to do that isn't obviously stupid, right? So, yep. you know, the nice thing about graphs and hypergraphs is they, they have an a priori notion of spatial distance because yep. you can just, you know, if you want to know the distance between two points, you can just count how many hyper edges or how many edges you have to traverse between the two. And so because of that, their rewriting rules preserve locality. They preserve spatial yeah. distance in the causal structure in a way that these other models don't necessarily do. So that's already good because it means that now if you try and build a causal graph or a causal set out of a, out of a hypergraph rewriting system, it's much more likely to be manifold-like than if you just grew it yeah. from some more arbitrary algorithmic dynamics. Couple that with the fact that there's a very nice relationship to general covariance because now you can make a correspondence between different updating orders in the causal graph and different rewriting orders for the hypergraph. And so each, each updating order in the causal graph will give rise to a different hypergraph that's produced by a different sequence of rewrites. And that corresponds yeah. effectively to a new space like hypersurface. Again, this is not something you could make work with a cellular automaton or a string or a, or a Turing machine yeah. or something just because it has such a rigid notion of space. Because in a graph or a hypergraph, the notion of space is, is kind of maximally dynamic or maximally unstructured, Suddenly you yeah. can make that work. And so it becomes much more plausible that you can have compatibility with things like general covariance. And so once you've discarded the other things that you might have thought to use, graphs and hypergraphs just turn out to be the, you know, the, the, the next obvious thing and they work beautifully. Yeah, and it's almost sort of obvious that this is going to be the case because of some of the reasons that you say. I mean, you look at a hypergraph and it sort of already looks like space. It already has those kind of you know, properties of locality. And although we draw them in space, because we have to draw them on our computer screen somehow, they're not actually something that are in space, they are space, and so they don't suffer from any of those problems of those other approaches. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast, or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, This might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.